PFTOT Friday edition. We just wrapped up PFT Live. Chris Sims never works on Friday, so it's just me. A few things that we didn't get to today during the program. And one is the reality that the rookie minicamps will continue to unfold throughout the National Football League. We saw some last week. We'll see more this weekend. And we're seeing more and more of the rookies actually sign their contracts before they set foot on the field. That's an important thing to do. You want to have that full financial protection that comes from being under contract, especially if you have guaranteed money in that contract. Yes, if you would get hurt during the rookie minicamp, you would have protection. You would still get the contract you would have gotten anyway. Just go ahead and get it ahead of time. Every agent should be pushing and every player should be pushing every agent to get those contracts done before the player ever does anything official on behalf of an NFL team, even if it is the voluntary offseason program. Now, as it relates to the rookie minicamps themselves, there's a potential for injury, and we've seen it happen. And one of the reasons why guys get injured during rookie minicamp, they haven't practiced football in months. What do they do after the season ends? They immediately begin to get ready for the scouting combine. They get ready for the specific events of the Underwear Olympics, and then after that, they get ready for their pro day workout. And then after that, they do some, some do some private workouts. They do a lot of traveling for team visits, and maybe you get out of your workout routine. You're not as in the kind of shape that you otherwise would be in during football season, during training camp, during the moment where you're used to participating in football practice. So these guys get thrust right back into it without any opportunity to get themselves into the kind of shape they need to be in. And they're out there. Think about it. You've got your draft picks at rookie minute camp, but you've also got undrafted free agents who are trying to get the coach's attention. You've got some guys who have been on the practice squad in the past who are still eligible to show up for the rookie minicamp. And then you've got the tryout players, the guys who aren't even on the team yet, who are clearly trying to get someone's attention so they will get an opportunity to compete for one of the 53 roster spots. Until you're on the 90-man roster, you can't even begin to do that. So there's a possibility that things will get a little bit heated. There's a chance that guys are going to be a little reckless. And you've got guys out there your, your prized draft picks, your lottery tickets that may become Hall of Famers, and they are thrust out there into this scenario where at times anything goes. They got helmets on. They don't have pads on. It can get a little bit physical. It's not supposed to. But that's all the more reason to consider doing what Adam Gase does. He did it for three years with the Dolphins. He's doing it this year with the Jets. No rookie minicamp at all. Just a rookie orientation. Instead of bombarding them with information and hoping they retain a small percentage of it, give them a chance to get comfortable where they are. They're going to have plenty of time to work, plenty of time to get ready. Why run the risk of injury and why make their first experience in the building a bad experience by just having too much going on, having guys who are clearly out of shape, not able to deal with the demands of practice? Maybe they should wait for that until training camp or at least later in the offseason program. One guy who signed his contract before his first rookie minicamp practice, Kyler Murray, the first overall pick in the draft of the Arizona Cardinals. And we reported last night at ProFootballTalk.com that he's got the same baseball clause that Jameis Winston had in his rookie contract with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And it goes like this. Any baseball activities void the future guarantees. So at that point, if Kyler Murray would decide to show up at spring training for some baseball team and, and participate in infield practice or batting practice or whatever, he would technically void the guarantees. Technically, the Cardinals would be able to say, your guaranteed money for future years goes away. But as a practical matter, what are they going to do? Are they going to cut him? No, they're going to keep him around. Now, unless these first two years are a complete and total disaster, there's no downside to losing the protection of the future guaranteed money. And I think Kyler Murray will know after a year or two whether or not he's in the good graces of the Arizona Cardinals. And if he decides to go play some training camp baseball, he, it, it really won't have a downside for him. He'll still be able to do it if he wants to. The bigger question is, what if he decides that he wants to play baseball? We've already seen him change his mind about not playing football after he had taken the Oakland A's signing bonus. If he decides at some point to play baseball instead of football, it's an easy solution. You pay back the unearned signing bonus money, and you go back and you play baseball. Now, there's no indication he's going to do it, but there's also no indication that he's going to be as good as the Cardinals think he is. He could be. Based upon what he did in college, he should be. But if he struggles, if he ends up being a bust after a couple of years and he decides, you know what, this just isn't for me, he could give back half of the signing bonus and go play baseball. It's that simple. You're not, you, the Cardinals can't stop him from playing baseball if that's what he decides to do. So that option is still there. The opportunity is still there. And whether or not he'd be inclined to do it depends largely on whether or not pro football goes the way that he hopes that it will. 
contract negotiations went the way that Xavier Howard hoped they would because he got a deal that he signed with the Miami Dolphins. Now, it's been reported as the best deal, highest paying deal for any cornerback in NFL history. And depending upon how you look at it, you could say, yes, that's accurate. But when we look at the full contract from signing and considering the fact that Xavier Howard still was under contract for one more year, he's averaging under $13 million a year. Josh Norman in the deal he did three years ago in Washington, five years averaging a straight $15 million a year from signing. So three years later, we still haven't seen anyone pass that $15 million per year from signing. And you can characterize Xavier Howard's deal however you want, but the right way, in my opinion, what is the deal worth from the moment you sign it? There was $1.2 million he was already due to make. You add that to the $76.5 million he'll make over the five years of the extension. It's a six-year contract, and it's worth less than $13 million a year. When you consider that he's committed for six years and how the salary cap is going to continue to go up and up, you've got new TV deals, you've got a new CBA, you've got money that will come in directly and indirectly from gambling. Xavier Howard may regret this one within a couple of years because, yes, it's a nice check to receive now. But by the time we get to 2021, 2022, there could be a lot of players at the same position making a lot more money than he does. A guy that the Saints put a lot of faith in last year in the draft because they gave up this year's first-round pick to trade up to get him, pass rusher Marcus Davenport. For the most part, his rookie season was a disappointment. He had injury issues, and also he believes he had missed opportunities. He still had four and a half sacks. He forced a fumble. He played in 13 games overall, but he recently said he saw little mistakes, hesitation, missed opportunities. He's got to go over it again and again and again and correct that and watch film on others as well in order to perfect his craft. You know, we expect rookies to come in and be great right away. And if they're not great right away, we start talking of them as busts. Plenty of guys will be dramatically better in their second season or maybe even as late as their third season. We are wired to expect a greater degree of immediacy when it comes to these young players who enter the NFL because we see so many guys who are great right away. It's still entirely possible Marcus Davenport is going to blossom into one of the best pass rushers in all of football. The Saints clearly thought enough of him to give up that first-round pick this year to move up to get him from uh, the Green Bay Packers in the spot that Green Bay held in last year's draft. So uh, we'll see what Davenport does. The bottom line is just because it didn't go the way he wanted or the Saints wanted last year doesn't mean he's a guy that we should write off. And as the Saints try to get back to the postseason for a third straight year, try to overcome the disappointing way in which their 2018 season ended, Davenport could, in theory, end up being a key piece, especially when you consider that Cameron Jordan, quietly one of the best pass rushers in football, is there to take some of the heat, could create some opportunities for Davenport to get to opposing quarterbacks. That's it for Friday's edition of PFTOT. We'll be back again on Monday with an all-new edition of PFT Live. We'll have content for you all weekend long at Pro Football Talk. Dot com And maybe, just maybe, late afternoon today, you will see an episode of PFTPM pop up. That's not a tease. I just don't know whether or not I'm going to have time to do it. If I do, I will, and you'll see it. Otherwise, we'll see you on Monday.